So Cham++, plus plus. Um, I'm going to begin with some uh, uh, motivating ideas, then I'm going to give you, uh, uh, jump into syntax a little bit, and then come back and do some case studies at the end. Um, some broad stuff that you all know, applications are getting more sophisticated, you know, with adaptive refinement, multi-scale modeling, and so on. Um, uh, applications now need uh, strong scaling up until like a few years ago, every time a new generation of computers come along, uh, scientists just would increase the resolution of the models that they had, and they are running larger models and larger machines, and they scale reasonably well, and that was, I mean, of course, there were challenges, but at least that part was okay. But now people are saying, no, that resolution is enough. I need to now take this molecule that has 100 million atoms or 10 million atoms uh, and for classical MD and scale it to the largest machine that, that I have so that I run it faster. So I think that's strong scaling, and that's, that's, that's uh, introducing its own challenges. Hardware is introducing challenges of variability, static variability, dynamic variability, heterogeneity, accelerators, regular processors, whatnot. Power, temperature, energy are in the uh, play right now, which we used to be able to ignore, and so on, and failures. Uh, so to deal with all of this, what should we do? And the viewpoint that we take is that we don't need full automation, completely automatically take your uh, application and parallelize it, or maybe MATLAB, or maybe equations, that would be nice, but that's infeasible. Uh, you don't want to put the full burden on application developers. So just like Brad said before, we want something that will improve your productivity. But I think uh, our take on that is we want a good division of labor between the system and application developers, and you will see what the take is in just a couple, couple of minutes. So what is CHAM++? Well, first, CHAM++ is a generalized approach to writing parallel programs. That means it is not a specialized language for one particular type of application. Uh, you can think of it as an alternative to, to MPI or Chapel and so on, uh, but it is not a language as, uh, uh, a, a, it's not an alternative to C, C++, and Fortran, for example. Um, the, uh, and it represents a style of writing program. So it's, uh, it has an adaptive runtime system that you'll hear more about, and it has an entire ecosystem that surrounds it with debuggers and performance tuning, uh, performance analysis programs, and so on and so forth. Um, so, uh, so there are three design principles that you have to understand to understand CHAM++. Uh, the first principle is something that we call over decomposition. That is, we let the programmer or we make the programmer decompose the computation, uh, the work units and uh, data units of the computation into many more pieces uh, than, than there are processors. And in particular, independent of the number of processors. Um, so, so that's not so hard. You're doing MPI, then you do decomposition anyways. We just kind of make you overdo it a little bit, right? And so maybe do 10 times more pieces than there are cores, for example. Um, the second thing is we want to make these pieces migratable across processors. Um, that means as a programmer, as an application developer, you don't think about processor. You think about these logical units into which you decompose your computation. Right? And then all the communication is expressed in terms of these logical entities uh, and not the physical underlying nodes or cores or anything like that. This means, this is actually makes things easier for the programmer, it's not hard, but it makes it harder for the runtime. It has to keep track of where your pieces are. They are migratable, they are moving around once in a while, and so the system needs to know where a particular piece that you addressed your message to is at this moment. The third thing is uh, asynchrony. Uh, this in our, uh, uh, it's another word for it or the way in which it comes about is message-driven execution. How does it come about? Well, you, you see now that you have over decomposed your computation. You have lots of pieces. These pieces are sitting on processors. They address each other via logical names. That means on any given processor, any given physical entity, there's going to be many of these pieces sitting there and many messages addressed to them sitting there. And so they need to be scheduled. So there has to be some kind of a runtime scheduler uh, in the run buried inside the runtime system that's saying, OK, what is the next thing I can do? It picks that next thing and uh, executes uh, the corresponding action. Um, so this is called message-driven execution or data-driven execution. And this means that we let the unit, let, let the work unit that actually has something to do continue working while you don't ever have like an MPI receive, 
and I'm waiting there for, uh, for the next thing to happen. You don't have that happen because the work unit that has the data ready will run. The work unit that's saying, hey, I need to wait for this data, well, is going to wait without bothering the processor, right? So this is message-driven execution. These three ideas then are implemented in CHAM++ um, and these, uh, the, uh, the over-decomposed entities in CHAM++ are called chars. Char is an old English for chore, a little piece of work. And chars are C++ objects, so you write your program in C++. Um, and, and they have methods, C++ uh, object-oriented programming, the functions that operate on the data encapsulated by the object are called methods. And these methods, uh, a subset of these methods are designated as entry methods in CHAM++. Entry methods are methods that can be invoked asynchronously and remotely by other objects. They don't, when they don't know which processor this object is on, they can still send the method invocation towards it, all right? Um, and that's what we mean by asynchronous. The call doesn't return anything. It just goes towards the object and executes at some point in, uh, in future. These charts are organized into index collections. So you might have an index collection uh, uh, that's three-dimensional index collection, or you might have a one-dimensional collection that, uh, that is sparse. Maybe they, they are num uh, objects from one to a billion, but not serially. That is some, only some subset of those between zero and a billion actually exist. That's what I mean by sparse. So they can be sparse or dense. They can be multidimensional. Um, or they can even be indexed by other things like bit vectors and strings. Um, so uh, so uh, I think I'll illustrate the next point with a, with a picture. So you, uh, so, uh, so you have a bunch of objects, all those circles. Some subset of those objects in a CHAMP++ application are globally visible. Right? And those are the ones that we call chars. Globally visible means they have a name that you can refer to from any other processor. And it's not the regular sequential local pointer. And then they invoke, they communicate with each other by asynchronous method invocations. So they, they name another object, not its processor, not its uh, address, but some kind of other global name, and then uh, invoke a method on it um, and, and that method invocation gets sent towards it. Nothing comes back from it. If it, something needs to come back, it will be sent by another method invocation. Uh, another pic picture here, what I was saying, illustrating what I was saying earlier, on any given physical processor, so this is a little bit of a look under the hood. On any given physical processor, what's happening? Well, there's a whole bunch of objects sitting there, and uh, there is at the bottom there is a queue of method invocations that have been sent towards that object that are sitting in a pool, sitting in a queue. The, the scheduler then just selects one of those um, and, and executes. Well, what happens when this orange object wants to send a method invocation to the 23rd object uh, of the collection A? So it says A square bracket 23 method foo and parameters. That's what it will say and say, okay, invoke this method foo in that object. The system will figure out where that object lives and uh, then um, uh, 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 find, uh, send that method, package that method invocation into some serialized uh, data and send it towards that processor. Uh, and then on that, it sits on that processor scheduler queue while it is executing other things. When the turn of this guy comes, the system picks it up and says, oh, that object, is it still here? Maybe it migrated away. If it is migrated away, then it will forward it to the right place. It happens infrequently. And otherwise, it will just say, okay, that object sitting there, invoke this method, run it to completion, control comes back to the system, and then it picks up uh, where, where it left off and starts picking the next message from the queue and continues on, all right? Um, so when this is happening on a large number of processors, well, some of them may be big, some of them may be small in terms of computational load. Well, the system notices that and says, hey, this is load imbalanced, and these guys are rocking with those guys, and let me get them together. And so it can move things around. The programmer doesn't have to know that things moved, right? Because their program, your application program, is agnostic to the location of the processor. So underneath, these things might be moving around, right? Uh, so once you basically, to summarize that basic idea, to this idea of over-decomposition, asynchronous migratability, those ideas as implemented in CHAM, you add 
introspection, the runtime system is continuously looking at what's going on, and adaptivity, it is trying to move things around in response to what it perceives as uh, inefficiencies. Then you get an adaptive runtime system, which can automate a variety of things. I will illustrate what kinds of things it automates um, in, um, uh, uh, throughout the talk, uh, but just as a very broad summary, uh, this picture shows the kinds of things it, it does. Uh, it can support things like automatic load balancing, overlap of communication and computation, resilience, energy optimizations, and so on, all under the surface without the programmer having to pay direct attention to it. Um, uh, there is a lot of talk now of multi-cores, many cores, and accelerators. Uh, uh, one of the things features, a uh, couple of features in this model are very attractive from the point of view of those. First of all, objects connote locality. You have a bunch of objects, and there is a significant, I mean, so you, you can refer to the data inside the object, but anything outside you have to make explicit um, uh, calls to, uh, to get the data, well, that actually encourages programmers to write things in a more cohesive way. The locality is very explicit to the runtime, and that gives you performance benefits right away. Uh, also, the fact that message-driven execution gives you a peek at the scheduler's queue. So the scheduler looks at the queue. It knows not just the, what's the next thing that it, it has to do, but next five things that it, it, it has to execute. Right? And those five things, it can say, oh, this needs that data, that needs that data. Which are, how does it know? It knows that because which object it is talking about. So looking at the method invocation, which object it is meant for, it can prefetch that object's data uh, ahead of time into the faster memories that are becoming prevalent in a variety of accelerators today. Right? Um, and so this is, this is one uh, utility of the model. If you look at another thing, if you look at communication, what happens in uh, applications today is you are doing some compute, I mean, simple applications, somewhat simple mindedly caricatured. Uh, you compute, you communicate, you compute, you communicate. Then you say, well, I'm spending 30% of my time in uh, communication. And then you do these optimizations uh, in, uh, in, in MPI that you hear about. You say, okay, move the sends up, move the receives down, or whatever it is. Uh, and, and, and basically say, okay, reduce uh, your communication time by doing a variety of techniques. And now you say, I'm spending only 10% of time now on communication. What does that really mean? That means 90% of the time your communication network is not utilized. Why is that not bad? Why do we always think about floating point utilization, uh, think as utilization? Oh, my floating point uh, efficiency is only 10%. That's bad. Well, what about c communication efficiency? So, uh, so what, how does the model help here? Well, having lots of objects on a processor means that the communication of one object is overlapped with the computation of another object automatically. You don't have to program for it. You don't have to do some uh, careful overlapping code. It's just natural consequence of the fact that you have over decomposed the program. So while one object is waiting for its data, another object is ready to execute. Just that fact means there's communication. First of all, latencies are tolerated by that. And second Second of all, communication spreads over the entire time step, so you utilize the network better. All right? Um, I'm running a slower than what I intended, so I need to pick up the pace a bit. Um, you, you, uh, not or skip some things. Let me see what I will skip. You decompose the computation to processors today. Instead, here you're decomposing them to. Uh, to, to the logical unit. So you have example from this uh, rocket simulation center that we had. We have solids and fluids, and the typical uh, thing today is to partition the solids mesh using, using say, Metis, uh, uh, fluid mesh using some other partitioner, and then the 15th piece of uh, solids and 15th of the fluid is sitting on the rank 15 because their partitioners call them 15th. No other reason than that, right? Instead, with this model, you can actually decompose solids into M pieces, fluids into N pieces, and, in, uh, and then let them com uh, communicate as they naturally will, and let the runtime sy system observe who is talking to whom and bring them together as, uh, as needed, right? Um, um, and I'll skip the point about uh, compositionality. Just had a nice animation, but I'll skip it. So uh, let's, let's go to the next. Uh, Next point, so then basically CHAM++ is a, a C++ based system based on objects, over decomposition, message driven execution, asynchrony, migratability, and it has an adaptive runtime system. 
So next I'm going to get into jump into the details of the language directly. So how do you define these objects? So, uh, so the way you do that is you write your code in C++, but you have to write one additional file whose type is .ci, which is charm interface file. So you have to describe interfaces in the CI file. In this particular program, there is only one object. Its class name is main, and it is declared as a main char. So in the interface file, you are saying, hey, this is a main module, which contains a main char, and it has one constructor method, which happens, to, which is constructors are always entry methods, and it's called main, same as uh, that method. And then in the C++ file, you say um, uh, just a usual class declaration, except when you have a char class, which is what this is, uh, then you have to say main char is a kind of char. So I will explain main char in a second. So may, uh, you say class main colon, it uh, inherits from a derived class called C base underscore main. Okay, where does that come from? Well, this interface file that you provided tells the system, hey, I need to generate some additional classes. For each one of your classes, the system generates a couple of other classes, some proxy classes that know how to package your messages, uh, some classes that know how to schedule your methods, and so on. You don't need to know about them, but your class must inherit from cbase underscore the class name that you gave, okay? So the cbase underscore class name is what the system generated. Um, and then, um, the code of this particular thing, okay, so main char, what is a main char? Well, main char is the place where the execution begins. So the execution of the program begins by creation of one object on processor zero or some processor, and that's where, uh, uh, and that object can create other objects and so on. In this case, that object is saying, hey, I give up, and it's saying hello world and CK exit, okay? So why CK exit? And that's all this, uh, this is just a simple hello world program. Why not exit? And the reason for that is because there are all these schedulers running on all the other processors that would never know if you just exited that, hey, the program has finished and they will keep spinning, waiting for something to happen someday. Uh, so therefore, uh, you, you have to call CK exit, right? Okay. Um, and then, uh, then those declare, the, I said that the .ci file used to generate some additional classes. How does, uh, so you have to include them in your program, and at the top of this file I am saying include hello decal.h. Hello is the name of the module, so hello decal.h is what is generated by the system, and that those are just forward declarations, and the actual definitions are at the bottom, hello def.h. So you can put the declarations in your .h file if you have a separate .h file, or you can just put them at the top uh, of, of the single .c++ file like I've shown here. Does that make sense? This is uh, just the mechanics of it. Okay. Um, now let's have slightly more complicated program, one in which you actually have not just the main object that comes, says hello, and goes away, but actually creates another object. So. In, in this case, we have two classes, one class called main, the other class called singleton, and the main, um, uh, they are both declared in the same module called hello, and so in the interface file, you are saying, hey, I have a main char, it has the constructor method, <coughs> and then I have a singleton char, which has its constructor method, and that's all we have. And so what do we do in the program? Well, in the program, in the C++ file, again, you include the declarations at the top, generated based on this, and you include the definitions at the bottom. The, uh, this is just plain C++ code. Otherwise, you inherit from C base underscore main. You in singleton inherits from C base underscore singleton. Those are system generated. And then you say, oh, uh, the main object is just going to create an instance of this object. So how does it create the instance? By the way, how many of you are reasonably familiar with C++? Raise your hand. Okay, and the rest of you kind of will, will follow along uh, basically by understanding what, what in C++ you just create new objects. That's a way in which you are creating entities, objects which have their own data and their own methods. And so there is, by the way, a Fortran interface to Champ++, and I'm not going to get into that here, but if you're interested, you can read up on that later. So, um, so, uh, so the way you create an object is not by calling new, but by calling the CK new method of the type of the object that, that you're about to create. So sing singleton is the name of that class, so it has associated with it a proxy class. 
system generated class. So you just have to say C proxy underscore uh, singleton colon colon CK new. That's the way you create an object of that type. What, what are you specifying? You are saying, hey, somewhere in the system, create one instance of this singleton object. You can provide parameters in this case, in this particular example, we are not providing any parameters. Create it somewhere, you're not specifying which processor, but somewhere create this uh, object. And that object eventually, like I showed in this earlier picture, will get, get created somewhere, and it will say hello world, and it will call CK exit. So even if it is that, that action happens on processor 23, every processor will say, okay, CK exit got called, we need to wrap up, collect statistics or whatever performance data if ne needed, and ex exit the code, all right? Okay, so the process of compiling a program, you write the .ci file, feed it to a compiler, which is called charmxi, charmc rather, uh, and the charmc compiler will produce those decal and def files, which you include in your, <coughs> in your program. So typically in a larger program than the simple ones that I showed here, you would include those in your uh, .h file, we'd include decal.h at the top, uh, the .c file will include the def.h at the bottom. You feed those files to your regular C compiler, but since you need to link some libraries, etc., cetera, charmc is the, uh, is the compiler uh, script that we provide, which wraps, uh, which, which produces, uh, includes those things automatically for you. That will produce a dot .object file. Again, you feed it to charmc, it will produce the executable for the particular machine that you want. Um, I don't think we need to get into building how to build Cham++. Hopefully your sysadmins would have installed Cham++ for you. Otherwise, you'll come back to this slide and figure out how to build Cham++. On, uh, for the exercises this evening, you shouldn't have to build it. It's already built uh, on the machine, when you, uh, on, on, on Vesta. And, and uh, what happens uh, to com when you compile a program? I already showed you charmc hello.ci, charmc minus c hello.c, Charms, uh, that, that's where those decal defs get included. Charmc hello uh, dot o, that produces the executable. For running, again, there is a code called charm run, uh, and there are other ways of running, but the simplest one here is charm run, and you specify how many uh, cores you want, plus p7 is the number of cores, uh, and then the name of the executable. Um, All right, so we, we already talked about, uh, we saw the example for module. Charm programs are organized as a collection of modules. Typically, one module uh, is in one file, um, um, the dot, once a dot .ci file. Um, the module that contains the main char is declared as the main module. For now, let's have a simple assumption there is one main char and one main module, one class which, uh, of which an instance gets created, that's your main, uh, main char, and the module that includes that is the main module. Advanced programming, you can learn about ability to create multiple main modules and main chars, which means that you can actually create multiple, uh, the program execution begins by creation of multiple main chars. But, uh, this is simpler way of, uh, simp simpler context of learning it. And so, all right, so we saw already what that is. We saw main char and entry method declaration. Each entry method declaration is basically entry, uh, now, this is just like a method declaration in the .ci file, but compare what you are doing here. Here, you have my char colon colon bar int parameter, here also you say entry, uh, return value is always void, because remember these are asynchronous method invocations, which means they're not going to return a value to you. You're going to send a method invocation towards them, they're going to use that parameters from the invocation, do something with it, and that's it. Maybe as a result they will send back something to you, but there is no return value. And so the return value has to be void. Uh, and then uh, parameter declaration looks for the scalars exactly the same as uh, it looks down here. So you have to declare it in .ci and then also declare it correspondingly into this uh, .c file. You have to make sure that they do match. If you're uh, once in a while what happens is you add a parameter here and forget to add it here. That's some a pitfall to watch for. Um, now uh, the main char 
has a constructor and you might have seen the me, uh, argument to that. It was CK arg message. CK arg message is just a message that contains arg C and arg V, just like your normal C programs. Um, it, it just uh, count of arguments and the uh, string containing the uh, arguments. And it, the main char will use that and whatever else it knows and it will create other objects, okay? Um, so creating a char, we already saw the CK new uh, on, on an earlier uh, slide, but when you create it, you, you want to be able to communicate it within future, you actually get a proxy back, right? And so you get, get a pointer back to it. Normally in C programs, C++ programs, you get a pointer back when you create an uh, object. In CHAM++ programs, you get a proxy back, which is a global handle. Remember that earlier picture that some objects are all visible globally? Well, that cannot be done through a regular pointer unless you're using UPC++, as you'll hear a bit later, but in CHAM++, it's a proxy that you, that, that you create. Right, and so, so, so proxy object is a special kind of object which is returned by CKNU, and then, uh, so its type is cproxy underscore your class name, right? So every class called mychar has a associated base class, cbase underscore that, it has an associated proxy class, cproxy underscore that same class name, and so you, you can store the reference to that global reference to that object into this proxy uh, into this proxy object right and so you can find why is, why do you need that c base underscore well one of the things that you inherit is a variable called this proxy that's basically saying what is my global name what is the name by which everyone else can communicate with me that's this proxy and then you can get that and then pass it in messages and method invocations to others so so you, then others can send uh, invoke a method back in you Right? So this is how you obtain your own global name. Um, oh, mm, let's skip past that. Uh, I already explained the CK exit. So, um, and we already saw this example before. Uh, so, but this is slightly more complicated example. It is just a simple char, uh, but it's doing something. So it is kind of structurally similar to my earlier program where a main char created a, a singleton char. Well, here the main char is creating a simple char. Its name is simple, and uh, it, uh, the constructor takes two parameters, and what we are trying to do is the object's job is to simply uh, uh, print the area of a circle of a given radius, right? And But we are kind of saying, hey, this chart must be dumb. We, we, it doesn't know what pi is. We are going to even provide it the value of pi uh, as a parameter just for fun. And so uh, this y is actually the uh, 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 pi, right? And so here we are passing uh, um, pi as the first parameter, and uh, that's that coming from there, and 12 is the radius, and it's just going to say, oh, radius square multiplied by pi, the circle of radius x is y star x star x. That's all. It doesn't do anything useful, but we're going to but pay a little bit close attention because we're going to do a useful puzzle with this, right? And then it calls CK exit, telling all the schedulers in the system, hey, that's all we needed to do, terminate. Okay? So this is kind of, okay, yes. Uh, from main we call simple. Yeah. So why simple calls CK exit, not the main class? Because because that simple guy knows is everything is done. So what is CK exit? It, remember the main is not getting a return value from from pi, uh, uh, from its call to CK, uh, uh, to simple, right? There, there are no return values. Therefore, all that happened is uh, the main object got created. It created the simple object, which is sitting here. The main is sitting here, maybe on different processors. This simple object was given some parameters. It did its work, printed what it needed to print. And now what needs to happen? What needs to happen is you need to shut down all the schedulers everywhere and exit the program. Anyone can do that, right? I could send a method invocation to the main and say, hey, please do that for me. But why? I can do that my, myself, and so I call CK exit, right? Um, so, uh, so now these method invocations are asynchronous. What does that mean? That means that if I have a proxy.foo and proxy.bar calls coming from one place, there is no guarantee that foo will execute before bar. Okay. So, uh, so, uh, and 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 uh, and this is because this is to keep things very efficient. When you need the sequencing like that, you can impose that sequencing by some mechanisms that maybe we, uh, we'll talk about in a few uh, few minutes. But the default policy is complete asynchrony. 
And so you get used to asynchrony right from the beginning and you, uh, uh, you have to stumble with it and uh, struggle with it for a bit. Uh, but eventually it turns out that that's a very useful skill, uh, skill to have. And then you learn to control it through structured dagger and other mechanisms that we'll show, uh, show you. Um, So this is, this is showing the same example. If I call foo and then call bar, you can get foo executes or bar executes printouts in any order. All right, so now given that, let's come back and make a slightly complex version of all. These are trivial uh, uh, examples, but I, I love giving trivial examples because that's the way some concepts become clear, and then you start doing real programs, these, these ideas stay with you. So you create an object, the main char creates one instance of the simple object, but this time it's going to say, hey, I'm going to supply to you the value of pi for the first time because you don't know it. Uh, I, I joke about it because obviously you could define it as a constant, for example, right? But this is just for the sake of example. I'm go giving, going to provide it the value of pi in, as a constructor parameter, right? And then I'm going to say, hey, now that you're ready to calculate, uh, you have pi and you can ready to calculate uh, areas of circles, I'm going to send you more work. I'm going to send you, hey, find area of this circle, then find area of that circle. I'm going to send you 10 circles to uh, find and uh, areas of and print, and then terminate the program, right? So. Let's see how that looks like. In the .ci file, you say I have a main object with the standard parameter. I have a simple object with a, a constructor parameter uh, y, which you and I know will be pi. And then um, find area method, which is an entry method, no return type, obviously, you find area. And then it has a radius, uh, and it has a Boolean called done. The Boolean called done is basically trying to tell that object, hey, uh, print the area of this circle, and you are done after that, right? Just call CK exit. We are done. We are not going to do anything. The whole program is done. All right. So, uh, so this is what it looks like. The main object creates one instance of the simple object right here, gets back a proxy to that, which is kind of like a global pointer, and then it runs a loop, I going from 1 to 10, didn't begin with zero, but let's say begins with i going from one to 10. And so one less than t i less than 10, that means it's going to go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And all those nine times is going to call, hey, find area of a circle with radius one, of radius two, of radius three, up to nine, every time providing the second parameter as false, saying, hey, you're not done yet. And the last time it is saying, hey, uh, find area of circle of radius 10, and true, you are done now, right? We are done now. The program is done. So what does that, that do? Uh, it does the usual thing. It just records the value of pi in the variable y, and then um, it says hello, and then every time it's given the find area, it prints the area, and then calls, uh, if, if the done is true, then it calls CK exit, shutting down all the schedulers in the system. This has a bug. How many of you spotted the bug? OK, you did. You did, OK. Uh, what is the bug? Asynchronous exit will, can happen before the last. Ah, yeah. Who said that the 10th method invocation will reach that object 10th time? It might, you might get the first, third, uh, second, fifth, and then 10th all of a sudden. And then without doing all 10 of them, it is, it is ex, uh, ex, uh, exited. So, um, so data types. Now, when you're packaging meth parameters, you get to specify, you, you, you might want to pass an array of um, um, ints in this case, for example, as a parameter. In your C code, you're going to say int length and int star data. But really, the system needs to know a way of packing that data when you send, do the method invocation. So in your declaration, you're going to say, uh, foobar is a method which has length as a parameter, and it has a data as an array of ints, um, and the size of that array when I call you, it's going to just be a pointer, but I, I'm telling you here that the size of that array is length. It could be length square, it could be length plus five, any expression involving other parameters or some other variables, constants, and so on, are allowed in that expression that you can make for uh, the size of the data being sent. All right. Um, so index collection. So far we looked at main char, simple char, singleton char. These were all singleton chars. 
by themselves, right? Now, they can be organized into index collections. And the index collections are useful for things like block of a matrix, and you, you, you need to have a collection of those blocks. You have a chunk of an unstructured mesh, and you would have a whole collection of these unstructured mesh chunks, along with maybe chunks of other things, and so on. Um, so, uh, so the collections of objects are structured uh, collections are one dimensional through six dimensional. I think seven is now supported, but uh, these can be sparse and uh, unstructured. That's anything hashable. So, um, so you can create this collection statically. That means you can say, hey, create for me a three dimensional array of uh, chars uh, of size 10 by 20 by 20. Or you can say, hey, create for me a three-day collection of chars, and I will, I won't give you the size right now, but I will slowly insert them into, into these uh, objects into this collection. So you can dynamically insert elements into a collection with a given index. Um, so uh, how does that look? Well, let's write a hello program. Uh, instead of char hello, the class name is hello, instead of just being char hello in the .ci file, we say, hey, it's a collection. You have to be careful about that word array. It is not a data array, okay? It is an array of objects. So uh, it has some chunkiness to it. And so it's a one-dimensional collection of objects called hello, and that's all that you need to uh, do here to specify that. In this particular case, it also has a method called print hello, print hello, and this is how that's going to go. You're going to create, the main object is going to say, I'm going to create uh, a, a new, entity or new collection of type hello, which happens to be a one-dimensional collection. Therefore, I'm telling you there are 23 elements, whatever the array size is elements. Uh, it, um, and the parameter that I'm passing to them is also happens to be array size. And so uh, what does print hello uh, do when it, cre it gets created? It just says hello. And let's say if it's index, so it's using its index, this index is uh, whatever its index is, if it is the last index, that's fine, then it exits, otherwise it sends the message to the next guy. This, this proxy square bracket, this index plus one dot print hello. Invoke the print hello method on the next object of my collection. My collection is this index, right? this proxy. This proxy is my collection, and this index is the index into it and of my, my index, and then you're adding one to that. Does that make sense? So this is how object collections work. This is actually what you learned so far pretty much defines almost entirety of CHAM++. You need reductions and broadcast. So, uh, so if you don't understand this part, ask questions uh, now. Basically, this proxy is the name of the collection. You can get two-dimensional uh, indices, in which case it's this index dot x, this index dot y. In this case, it is this index, which is my serial number in my collection. And you may have multiple such collections in a program. And you can refer to anyone else by their index, right? Their array proxy and their index is how you refer to objects, <clears throat> okay? You run this program, what I just showed you, and you turn on traces. We'll, uh, all that you have to do is to, at link time, you can say trace mode, dash trace mode projections at link time, uh, and you will get some log files. You can run them uh, through our performance visualization tools, and you'll see that, oh, there were 16 objects, whatever number of objects created, and every processor appears to have four objects, and they seem to be block mapped by the system because I can see that the hello chain is going from this to this to this to this to a crossing processor to those four and so on. So this is uh, a nice performance visualization tool that you get and very easy to use, uh, use tool. Collective communications, you actually can do uh, uh, reductions and broadcast. Broadcasts are very intuitive and straightforward. Remember, hello array is, for example, here being created as a collection of objects. So CK new hello array size is declared as a one-dimensional collection. So if the hello array size is 25, the, um, it's going to create 25 objects of type uh, hello array and give each one of them an index and spread them across the system, right? Uh, then if you say uh, this proxy, which is uh, one of the members says, what is my proxy? Or you can actually use the hello array as a proxy and say square bracket five dot foo, that means the method invocation go to the fifth uh, uh, element of that collection. But if you omit that square bracket five, it goes to the whole collection, that's a broadcast. So broadcast to the collection is done simply by omitting the square bracket object uh, index part. 
And so that, that, that's as simple as that. Reduction is, doesn't get to be as simple as that because reductions are asynchronous right from the beginning. MPI now has asynchronous reductions as you have been uh, uh, learning, I assume. But uh, CHAMP++ has had asynchronous reductions right from the beginning. And the asynchronous reductions are done kind of like this. So uh, you basically, what you do is you name an entry method and, uh, as a target of a reduction, and then you can contribute into reduction. So this contribute call basically says that, hey, uh, I have this data, put it into the reduction, and when the reduction is done, invoke that method over there, right? And while you can keep doing other stuff, right? And your object, other objects can keep computing. When the reduction result is ready, it will be sent to wherever you specified it should go. So I, I will be very brief uh, for this part. But this part is basically saying is that so far what we learned is basic CHAMP++. You have objects, you have collections of objects, you have asynchronous method invocations, broadcasts, and reductions, right? Now, the program that you write using this basic language is going to be very reactive. That is, an object is a reactive entity. It, if in, you invoke this method, it does this work, and maybe will send some other message. If you invoke that method, you'll do that work and send some other messages and whatnot. But what does it really do? What is its life cycle? It's not separately expressed. It's an emergent property of their actions, right? Instead of that, but very commonly, we have a life cycle. Sometimes you don't have a life cycle. An object really is reactive and it's doing work that when and if asked to do that work. But sometimes, oftentimes in science applications, you are doing some iterative programs and these objects have a life cycle. And you should be able to express that life cycle and you express that life cycle in a, uh, in CHAMP program using this notation called structure dagger, which allows you to express a DAG, a directed or cyclic graph, between method invocations and computations. Completion of computations and com receipt of uh, method invocations uh, can trigger other computations. And the, the basic idea in that, in, that, in that notation is something called a when block, right? A when construct is basically you write these structured dagger scripts in the .ci file. You can think of them as a scripts. These are scripts for the object. You write them in the .ci file. So normally your entry method will say entry void some method parameter declaration semicolon because the actual de definition of that method is coming in the .c++ file. But in the .ci file itself, if you uh, have a curly brace, well, that means it's a structured dagger method. And the when there is kind of like a uh, a blocking receive, except all that it is blocking is your object, not the whole processor. And so when entry method with these parameters, entry method one is received, that invocation is received, execute block one. When entry method two is received, execute block two. If this comes first, no, it won't execute the block two. It will wait for method one to uh, arrive and execute block one, and block three will execute only when those two are finished. So there's an implicit sequencing going through the, uh, through the when blocks. Right, And in fact, this when, and you can, when I said block one or block two, they can be nested constructs. They can be other when blocks and so on. And the only other thing that I will show you is that all the parameters are accessible inside the block. And the other thing that I will show you, well, serial is important. So you can write something like um, when something happens, execute this block of C++ code. In the .ci file, if you're writing C++ code, our compiler doesn't want to touch C++ code. It's too hard to parse that. So you say, if you write C++ code inside the curly braces here, you better put a serial tag on it. You can call it serial or you can call it C++ code. What that is telling the system is that serial, curly brace to curly brace, don't look inside of it. It's just some C++ uh, stuff executed when you come to this point, right? That's what serial means. Um, and you can write, you can, uh, instead of nesting, you can write them together. When m1, param1, param2, and method invocation m2 with param3 comes, execute this code block, which could itself be other when statements and so on. And throughout this code block, you have access to param1, param2, and, and so on. Um, there is some boilerplate uh, stuff that you have to do with it. You will see an example of that when we write the code, uh, code this evening. But you have to write some. Uh, uh, since, well, anyways, I, I don't want to uh, go into a C++ rant, but, we, uh, but uh, let's skip past that and look at that in the example. Um, skip the boilerplate. You can say when, when you write a method, 
you can actually put when method one square bracket 100. That means if the first parameter matches this, only then consider it that when to be satisfied. Kind of like a tag in, uh, in, in MPI, except it's dynamic, but you know, it's a variable. And so you can do variables, uh, I'm sure, to, uh, in MPI too. It's not common. And so this reference number must match this, and then it's considered a match. Um, you can write if then else while and for statements in the .ci file, so you can write regular scripts with that. And probably more interestingly, essentially you lose uh, asynchrony by this, isn't it? You basically said, oh, your object can execute anything that it wants comes its way. Now you're saying, no, no, not anything. It must first execute this and then that. That's what the when statements did. And you can bring back that asynchrony through an overlap statement that basically allows you to express things like this. You basically are saying, hey, if E1 comes first, then execute that. If E4 comes first, execute that. E2 depends on E1, and E5 depends on E4. So there are separate chains of messages and uh, method invocations and computations, but they can progress in any order they want, all inside a single object. A single object is always running inside a single core, or at least a single node. Um, all right, I think I want, I will show you an example of uh, uh, Jacobi. Uh, but uh, this is actually complete. This is a standard example. Everyone should sh uh, everyone shows this. So Brad showed that at, uh, towards the end. But this one here is not like his uh, array syntax. We don't have that. So it has the standard sequential syntax. And but it's basically at the beginning you are saying, hey, send your data to your neighbors, right? And so in this case you, are, you have only two neighbors. And so you take your bottom strip and uh, top strip and send it to. Uh, uh, to the other guy, you send both the strips to the neighbors, you wait for both of them, and then you do, uh, do the work, you contribute into a reduction, when the reduction says it's converged, which you could do asynchronously, you can do actually other stuff in the middle, then you, you can say, okay, if, if it is converged, then, then I call CK exit from one of the objects, otherwise I continue uh, looping, right? So. Okay, I think, I think without going into the details, that's roughly, uh, roughly the code. If you wanted to add load balancing to it, this is all that you do. You say, I'm not going to do load balancing every time period, but every so many time, uh, iterations, I'm going to call this call, which actually does the load balancing, and when I resume from load balancing, then, I, so I'm just saying when, using that when statement to just put the weight right here. So every so many iterations, I will do the load balancing. When I wake up, I maybe find myself on a different processor, and then I continue execution, right? So the champ plus plus of philosophy is to let the programmer decompose the work into coarse-grained entities. What, is, what do we mean by coarse-grained entities? You don't write something where each object, uh, there is a float for, uh, each float becomes an object, each, um, uh, integer becomes an object. No, you have to chunk them. You don't wait for some system to automatically decide your chunk size. You have to do it manually. So how do you do it? Examples are the best way to illustrate it. This is a very old example. Uh, running, uh, in, uh, running on 16 processors, there were no cores and nodes separated in those days, and 16 processors, you can run decompose a finite element mesh into 16 uh, chunks. Uh, instead, with CHAM++, we decompose them into 128 pieces and let the runtime system map those two processors. Molecular dynamics example on blue orders running a 100 million atom uh, simulation on 128K cores, which is 4K nodes, we used 5.5 million objects. On Edison, running on 4K cores, a very small 92,000 atom benchmarks, we use 33,000 objects. So the, you can get an idea of the size of the object uh, from that. Uh, running a weather simulation code, uh, uh, 64, uh, uh, 64 cores, 1,024 objects. That's enough to do load balancing. 16 cores on each uh, processor, well, that's enough to say, oh, my percentage variation of load is such and such. Well, I can take 10% of the objects or 20% of the objects away, and I'm OK. All right? So usually that ratio works, works fine. And the, if you want to think a little more abstractly about it, it's the fact that you have, if you plot grain size on x-axis and execution time on the y-axis, you get a plot that's kind of like this uh, on one processor. If you get really fine grain, your execution time is bad. But as soon as you cross that threshold, it's good. And on many processors, then you get serialization at this end. So this whole range is okay. 
So basically what you have to do is set the grain size to be, you know, and, and what do I mean by grain size? Grain size is uh, amount of computation you do per method invocation. To be hundreds of microseconds, you are absolutely okay. Tens of microseconds, in most cases, you are okay, right, on most machines today. So that's roughly what the grain size uh, decisions are. Here is a particular uh, data point uh, of doing that Jacobi-like but three-dimensional computation. Mm, you can put maybe 256 objects per core with two megabytes of data as kind of that flat region, beginning of that flat region. Um, so now let me just point to a couple of case studies and, st uh, and then stop. Uh, it's going to be a very brief uh, review. NAMD is one of our uh, oldest programs. Uh, it's a collaboration with Klaus Schulten. There are by now 70,000 register, registered users. A uh, couple of years ago, the HIV capsid structure was determined using uh, NAMD. And its structure, it's kind of instructive to look at how it is decomposed, right? You, you have classical molecular dynamics, atom to atom force, uh, forces need to be calculated. Um, and so these are spatially cut off. That means you don't want to calculate explicitly the forces, with electrostatic forces between two atoms that are separated beyond a certain cutoff distance. And so what we do is you decompose the uh, atoms into cubes. Uh, those are orange cubes there, and uh, spatially, and then uh, every pair of neighboring cubes, there, we postulate another object, which is this purple object, force calculation object. So you now have two char arrays, one the orange one, one the purple one. And in fact, for bonds and other things, you have other char arrays. And for part, uh, particle mesh A wall, which is a 3D FFT calculation, you have another set of arrays. And you write your program logically in terms of these cubes and diamond objects. Right? And the runtime system will then map these objects onto processor. This design that we did in 93, 96 maybe, uh, is, is still going strong today with some modifications. And that's the beauty of this object-based decomposition is that the same methodology will continue to go uh, um, um, far in, into future. So I won't show you, this is the, one of the uh, performance views in projections, um, but it has scaled to a million cores uh, so far. Changa is another program for computational astronomy. And you take the tree, uh, the arc tree decomposition, which is very natural for that, but not used often because uh, it creates load imbalances. Well, we can handle load imbalances. So we do that. Uh, we take the pieces of the tree as objects, decompose them, uh, d distribute them to processors under the runtime control. And that has scaled to half a million uh, processor cores as well. And especially for multiple time stepping, very high density variation scenarios, it does very well. Um, Episymptomics is another code which is, was recently in the news because of the Ebola uh, epidemic and its use in that. It simulates a spread of uh, contagion uh, through populations. It doesn't have to be disease. It could be information, viruses, uh, uh, computer viruses, and so on. Um, so that has scaled very well as well. Open Atom is a quantum chemistry application. And the interesting thing about that application is that we're able to do topology aware, um, processor topology aware mapping of that application to processors, which I won't uh, tell you much about here. Um, and we have a several mini apps. If you're interested, you can go to our website and pull down these mini apps. These are typically a few hundred lines of code and we'll illustrate various interesting classes of applications and how they can be done efficiently using CHAM++. I wanted to mention, well, there is a book uh, which, which has many of these applications described. And I want to allude to the fact that for exascale issues such as resilience and power and energy, CHAM++ is an excellent fit because what you can do uh, for application variability applies to machine variability as well. And so we have quite a bit of interesting work on fault tolerance. Um, uh, automatically, you can actually run a CHAMP program tonight. If you get to that, you will see that you'll, I don't think you, you, you'll do it tonight, but you can actually kill minus nine a process and the program will recover from that and run the production feature in CHAMP++. Uh, cooling energy is an example, right? So saving cooling energy is, um, perfect is uh, uh, very easy. You just walk up to the thermostat and turn it up. 
you save the cooling energy in your machine room. Uh, why don't you save the energy that way? Well, you're, there's a reason why you set the temperature low, your chips will start burning. Well, they don't all burn at the same time. The reason uh, you have to keep it cold is because some processors get hot pretty quickly. Well, you can monitor their temperature these days. You can monitor your laptop temperatures, right? So the runtime can monitor the temperature and reduce the frequency and voltage uh, of the ones that are getting hot. Well, that creates a load imbalance. Fine, that's a problem we know how to solve. We just migrate objects around and balance the load. And so we're able to show that you can actually save cooling energy and control temperatures uh, very effectively through this. And there is actually a wide variety of other power energy related work uh, that, that bases itself on this ability to flexibly move objects around between processors. You can tell, tell a job, hey, you're running on 1,000 nodes, give 100 nodes back to me. And it will say, fine, 900 nodes, I'll spread my objects around to them, right? And you get 300 nodes back later on, yeah, I can, I can use them. I can spread my objects around to those. So you can do all kinds of interesting things like that uh, in Charm++. If you want to know more about it, go look at charm.cs.illinois.edu. Uh, the system is available for download as well as documentation and so on, all right? Thank you. Um, does the charm.ci files, do they support templates? Uh, yes. Yes, they do. I think uh, uh, any qualifiers in that statement, you'll have to ask my grad students, but, uh, but they do. Um, yes. Uh, can you quantify the performance loss due to the, the loss of locality? Loss of locality, the gain of locality, you mean? Uh, no, in fact, uh, there is always a question about doesn't over decomposition cost you a lot because you're breaking things down into small pieces. Actually, it turns out the cost, uh, you always see the benefit, and that's because the blocking effect of, uh, uh, of, of, of decomposing things into smaller objects. So you get better cache performance. So if you really want to look for the cost, you have to subtract off. You have to do an application in such a way that there's no cache benefit. And then the, then the cost is typically a few hundred nanoseconds of the scheduling cost. That's all that you get. Now, the locality, maybe you're thinking that, oh, I had these objects that you would have been on the same processor. Now they are on different processors because they're just objects and the system will migrate them uh, somewhere. Well, the system is monitoring who talks to whom. And so objects that talk to each other more will typically be kept on the same processor. So the locality loss in terms of messaging uh, is very tightly controlled. It's not there. In fact, it's a basis for why we can do topology optimizations. I didn't just mean messaging. I meant, I meant uh, cache aware. No, cache, cache locality is better when you block things. When instead of having one monolithic big object in which you are looping over, if you make 100 objects, each one is w more tightly local. And in fact, if you're doing more computations in that, you'll get much higher reuse. It will fit within. Uh, L3 cache or L2 cache, whichever one. What. So how does the runtime know that task A and task B operate on the same? No, they don't. Every t every object has its own data. Well, okay, but then it's then 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 the data reuse is lost. Then, then what? Then the data reuse is effectively lost. If task A and task B operate on the same data, and ideally. If one would program it in a, in a traditional way, then, then, then I would- If I they would operate on the same- them one after another, yeah. so, that, so that they keep the data fought in. Yes, yeah. if they operate on the same data, they should belong to the same char object. But what if I want to parallelize the computation task? Yes, you parallelize it by decomposing the data. Right, what am I missing here? There, there may be different functional things that are operating on the same data. You can, you can deal with that by... Uh, so you cannot, so you cannot obtain effectively task parallelization without losing data locality. I don't believe this is true, but you'll have to give me a concrete example. I'm not seeing, seeing it. But if you're trying to think about, for example, here's the data, here is, uh, here is one function on it, here is another function on it, that's, easy, that, that's completely local. That's, that, that locality is not lost. We can go into the details in the break, but that locality is not lost. And did you have a question here in the back? No. Yes? Uh, just from a high level, I was wondering if the quality of your network, of your interconnect or whatever, is a limiting factor for Charm++ plus, plus, plus programs. Not, uh, uh, no, 
because of the reason that I said earlier that the, it spreads the communication over the time step and because of the fact that we can actually do topology aware mapping of objects, it is better the net limitation of the network is felt less in CHAMP++ than in say a, a MPI like uh, model, right? Yes. I'm really not understanding how does, uh, if you kill a process with one of the things and how does it still manage to work? Oh, <laughs> the, uh, uh, yes. Uh, so very simple. Uh, there is a buddy process for every process it's detecting the heart, it's, they are exchanging heartbeats, and so someone detects that it failed. Okay, up to that is fine. Every so often, an in-memory checkpoint of each object is stored in the buddy process, uh, buddy process, right? And so when things fail, as well as the, uh, uh, locally, when, when a failure is detected, everyone goes back to their checkpoint, which is stored locally, right, on every process, no communication, and then that one failed process is resurrected either on a spare processor or spread across uh, the uh, object spread across the remaining. Spare processor is much easier, so spare processor is picked up, it starts uh, running, and it gets the checkpoint from the buddy. So in effect, if more nodes are available, it can spread across more internet time? I mean that is a separate uh, thing. Shrink and expand, shrinking and expanding of processors is possible because the program is expressed in terms of objects.